to know what direction the wheel turns you need to know which direction the wheel of samsara turns oh. <laughs> because obviously this is not an answer that can be answered by a question that can be answered by north south east or west right <laughs> so to know which direction the wheel of the dharma turns you need to know which direction it doesn't so or what the buddha called dependent origination and the core of uh, his teaching on causality and um, where things originate from and that's where that direction is I think you might understand and the Eightfold Path is basically the other way so this is the great discourse on origination causality Mahanidana Sutta and uh, it is at Kamma Sadhamma the same town as the Satipatthana was recited and this is the sutta where the venerable Ananda goes to the, the Buddha and says it is wonderful Bhagavan it is marvelous how profound this dependent origination is and how profound it appears and yet it appears to me as clear as clear <laughs> Do not say that, Ananda, do not say that. This dependent origination is profound and appears profound. It is through not understanding, not penetrating this doctrine, that this generation has become like a tangled ball of string, covered with a blight, tangled like coarse grass, unable to pass beyond states of ho, woe, the ill destinies, ruin, and the round of birth and death. And it is profound and also explained in different ways because it works in many different ways. But this is a very good explanation of it, I find. If Ananda, you are asked, has aging and death a condition for its existence, you should answer yes. If answered what conditions aging and death, you should answer aging and death is conditioned by birth. What conditions birth? Habitual tendencies or blind habit patterns condition birth accumulating through holding on or clinging conditions habitual tendencies discontent conditions holding on sensations condition discontent contact conditions sensations mind and body condition contact consciousness conditions mind and body if asked has condition a condition consciousness ha a condition for its existence you should answer yes if asked what conditions consciousness, you should answer mind and body conditions consciousness. Oh, so in other suttas, the Buddha says it turns back here. Mind and body's condition is supported by consciousness, and consciousness is supported by mind and body. Well, mind and body kind of says it in itself, but and then this is where it turns back 
Thus, Ananda, mind and body condition consciousness, and consciousness conditions mind and body. Interesting. Mind and body conditions contact. Contact conditions sensation. Sensation conditions discontent. Whatever sensation we feel, pleasant, unpleasant, that is the ground for saying, I like, I don't like. Discontent conditions holding on and accumulating. Holding on and accumulating conditions, habit patterns. Habit patterns condition birth. And birth here can be just, this is karma. This is, in this sutta, it's birth, like next birth. But just action through these habit patterns we just do them you just do these things because they're habits and there's that taking of a blind action not always completely blind but very influenced <laughs> so this is also a nuance that is really important to incorporate in there because it's not complete ignorance there is some understanding because in other suttas he w the buddha will say there's what conditions consciousness is, is these involuntary processes the sankharas which are mind and body also because there's three kinds of sankharas there's uh, uh, verbal bodily and mental but these are mind and body also and avijja which is lacking discernment or lacking knowledge of of these things but mainly the four noble truths is what is the support for this whole chain but as we are practicing the eightfold path for example we are weakening awija we are cultivating discernment and so it tends to be interpreted as this really uh, straight one-way thing where you like destroy ignorance and then you're liberated but <laughs> it's a gradual process and we're just like chewing away at the ignorance and actually growing understanding and changing and this is and this is the direction the wheel turns this is influencing the whole wheel from the ground up cultivating knowledge but we'll get to that a little bit and that is the eightfold path the dependent origination is the way things work mostly through ignorance and craving discontent but the eightfold path is the solution so here we have a blueprint of dukkha but we also have the the blueprint for happiness which we're also using Sunday, so in the sutta they're describing the, the unmanifested um, the unconscious as mind and body Before we name it, the, the sankharas that are not yet manifest, they describe it here as mind body. Yes, is that process, the consciousness, it will explain a little bit more. Uh, but it's that process of basically this is a, a whole wholly conditioned system process which we have a choice to cultivate the path or not but this is how the mind works and you can you can see it in people you can see it in animals if you look at animals they're you like uh, give your fingers to a goat gonna like think oh it's nice 
can I eat you? <laughs> that would be even better. <laughs> well, there's that. You can see each link of the chain. When there's that feeling, when there's that conditioned instinct, eating and taking action, habit and um, you actually, when we start understanding how this process works, we start noticing it in everything and how, how this is actually, and this turns back at name and form, mind and matter. Um, it is stored in a certain way in this process. Birth or karma conditions aging and death uh, and difficulties. <laughs> I'm not going to read this whole thing again. Thus, this whole mass of trouble comes into existence. I have said birth conditions aging and death, and this is the way that it should be understood. If, Ananda, there were no birth at all, anywhere, of anybody or anything, of devas to the deva states, of gandabas to the gandaba state, of yakas, of ghosts, of humans, of quadrupeds, of birds, of reptiles, to the reptile state. If there were absolutely no birth at all of all these beings, then when with the absence of all birth, the release from birth could With the absence of all birth, the cessation of birth, could aging and death appear? No, Lord. Therefore, Ananda, just this is the root, the cause, the origin and the condition for aging and death, namely birth. Aging and death can also be replaced by anicca, impermanence, just of this present moment. I have said habitual tendencies condition birth. If there were absolutely no habit, habit patterns in the sense world or the formless world, could birth appear? No, Bhante. Therefore, just this is the condition of birth, namely habit patterns. Now, this is an interesting relation to uh, in the worldly sphere and in the mental sphere so these two this is usually interpreted in the ultimate way of like jhanas and the spheres of matter and the spheres of the formless where if someone goes into the arupa jhanas, the formless jhanas, their rebirth is in the formless, yada yada yada. But this can also be just mind and matter, these habit patterns clinging to those. Holding on conditions, holding on and accumulating conditions, habit patterns. If there were absolutely no accumulation of sensuous clinging, clinging to views and clinging to rites and rituals, clinging to personality belief, could habit patterns appear? No Bhante. And this is a nice little list of the fetters. Discontent conditions accumulating. Oh. <laughs> if there were no discontent, and this is craving, I'm 
changing it up because I think it's just uh, much more applicable. For sight, sound, smell, tastes, tangibles, and man mental objects, could accumulation appear? No, Bante. Sensations, conditions, discontent. If there were absolutely no sensations, sensation born of eye contact, of ear contact, of nose contact, of co tongue contact, of body contact, sensations born of mental contact, in the absence of all sensations, with the cessation of sensations, could discontent appear? No. No, Bhante. Therefore, Ananda, just this is the root, the cause, the origin, the condition for discontent, namely sensations. And here, see, he always uses the Four Noble Truths. This is, this is it, the cause, its cause. The condition. And so, Ananda, sensations condition discontent. Discontent conditions seeking. See, now he branches off. He, now he starts another dependent origination. And that's an interesting one. Discontent conditions seeking. Seeking conditions acquisitions. Acquisitions condi condition taking a stand. Taking a stand conditions wanting. Wanting conditions attachments. Attachments conditions appropriations. Appropriations conditions avarice. Avarice conditions guarding of possessions. And because of guarding of possessions, there arise the taking up of stick and swords, quarrels, disputes, arguments, strife, abuse, lying, and other unskillful states. That's pretty simple. Maybe you should send that to some people. I have said all these unwholesome states arise because of the guarding of possessions. For if there were absolutely no guarding of possessions, would there be taking up of stick and sword? Yada, yada, yada. No, Lord. Therefore, Ananda, this is the root, the cause, the origin of these unskilled states. Avarice, appropriation, attachment, wanting, taking a stand, acquisition, condition, taking a stand, seeking conditions, acquisition. I have said discontent conditions seeking. If there were no discontent for sensual pleasure, continuation or discontinuation would there be any seeking no bante therefore ananda discontent is the root the cause the origin the condition for all seeking thus these two things become united in one by sensations and see this is the depth of and that's why he's explaining it in this way, is that there's not just one way of seeing this dependent origination. This is a very useful, like, basic template. But uh, he also branches off and says, see, that's... Uh, and often this will not be mentioned. So um, it works in many, many ways and levels. And now basically saying that all this is caused by feeling or sensation. <laughs> These sensations. I have said contact conditions sensations. Therefore, contact is the root, the cause, the origin, the condition for sensations. 
mind and body conditions contact by whatever properties, features, signs, or indications the mind factor is conceived of, would there, in the absence of such properties pertaining to the mind factor, be manifest any grasping at the idea of the body factor? If there was no anything of the mind, would there be any kind of knowledge of the body? Basically, that's what it says. <coughs> no, Bhante. Or in the absence of any such properties pertaining to the body factor, would there be any grasping at sensory reactions on the part of the mind factor? No, Bhante. Now you see the delineation between now there is a part of the mind that is fully dependent on the body and um, we'll see a little later well it is fully dependent on the body by a body By whatever properties the mind factor and the body factor are designated, in their absence is there manifested any grasping at the idea or at sensory reaction? No, Bhante. By whatever properties, features, signs, or indication the mind factor is conceived of, in the absence of these is there any contact to be found? No, Bhante. Contact is in the mind, but it's also in the body. And that is why when the Buddha praised awareness of body so much, Kayagata Sati, he said that awareness directed to the body or gone to the body. Uh, because whatever is experienced in the mind is also experienced in the body. And if there is craving, tension in the mind, there is tension in the body. And it keeps us from even thinking about it. We just feel tension and it's like, oh. <laughs> so this is where it comes from, this technique, to know that I in fact, mind and body come together. Then Ananda, just this namely, mind and body is the root, the cause, the origin, the condition for all contact. I have said consciousness condition mind and body. If consciousness were not to come into the mother's womb, would mind and body develop there? No, Bhante. So, we're going back to what we call the birth linking consciousness, which is at the moment of death, there is the last consciousness, and according to karma, the mental karma at that time, that consciousness, it doesn't stop, it just continues but with in another body it's taking another body at that point uh, but then the Buddha, even though it's dependent on the body again uh, it is that consciousness that is actually behind it No, Lord, and if the consciousness of such a tender young being, boy or girl, were thus cut off, would mind and body grow, develop and mature? No, Bhante. Therefore, Ananda, just this, namely, consciousness, is the root, the cause, the origin, the condition of mind and body. I have said mind and body conditions consciousness. 
if consciousness did not find a resting place in mind and body, would there subsequent, subsequently be an arising and coming to be of birth, aging, death, and trouble? No, Bhante. Therefore, Ananda, just this, namely mind and body, is the root, the cause, the origin, the condition of consciousness. Just taking things a little further. Thus far, then, Ananda can be traced. We can trace birth and decay, death and falling into other states, and being reborn. Thus far extends the way of designation of concepts. Thus far is the sphere of understanding. Thus far the round goes. As far as can be discerned in this life, namely to mind and body together with consciousness. In what ways, Ananda, do people explain the nature of the self? Some declare the self to be material and limited, saying, Myself is material and limited. Some declare it to be material and unlimited. Some declare it to be immaterial and limited. Some declare it to be immaterial and unlimited, saying, Myself is immaterial and unlimited. Whoever declares the self to be material and limited considers it to be so either now or in the next world, thinking, Though it is not so now, I shall acquire it there. Mm -hmm. That being so, that... That being so, that is all we need say about the view that the self is <laughs> material and limited. <laughs> and the same applies to the other theories. So much ananda for those who prefer an explanation of the self. How is it with those who do not explain the nature of the self? These are called the eel wrigglers. Those who kind of say, I don't say it's not, but I'm not saying it's not, not. So he says practically the same thing, just negated. In what ways, Ananda, do people regard the self? They equate the self with sensations. Sensation is myself. Now, this is a place where I would translate that as, because I'm like, this is written feeling here. But I would probably think in a way of felt experience, anything that is felt uh, or ex experienced, yes. Felt experience is myself. Felt exper or felt experience is not my myself. Myself is imperci impercipient. Or feeling is, uh, felt experience is not myself, but myself is not impercipient, basically percipient. It is of a nature to feel, to sense, to experience. Now Ananda, one who says, felt experience is myself should be told there are these three kinds of felt experiences friend pleasant painful and neutral which one of these do you consider to be yourself <laughs> when a pleasant feeling is felt no painful or neutral feeling is felt but only pleasant feeling when a painful feeling is felt, no pleasant or neutral feeling is felt, but only painful feeling. And when a neutral feeling is felt, no pleasant or, or painful feeling is felt, but only neutral feeling. Pleasant sensation. 
pleasant sensations are impermanent, conditioned, dependently arisen, bound to decay, to vanish, to fade away, to cease. And so too are painful feeling and neutral feeling sensations. So anyone who on experiencing a pleasant sa sensation thinks this is myself must at the cessation of that pleasant sensation think myself is gone. <laughs> and the same with painful and neutral sensations. Thus whoever thinks feeling is myself is contemplating something in this present life that is impermanent, a mixture of happiness and unhappiness, subject to arising and passing away. Therefore, it is not fitting to maintain sensations or myself. And that links back to that understanding that something that is, that anything that comes with hurt or that comes with unhappiness is the proof that there is no self. <laughs> Because nobody would ever, <laughs> ever be sad. Mm -hmm. Nobody would do that. But it does come. Why? Oh. But anyone who says, feeling is not myself, sensations are not myself, myself is impercipient, should be asked, if, friend, no sensations at all were to be experienced, would there be the thought, I am? To which he would have to reply, No, Bhante. Therefore, it is not fitting to maintain sensations are not myself, and myself is impercipient. If there was anything impercipient, it's just not percipient. Can't call it a self. And anyone who says feeling is not, sensations are not myself, but myself is not impercipient. Myself is of a nature to feel, to experience. Should be asked, well, friend, if all sensations absolutely and totally ceased, could there be the thought, I am this? To which one would have to reply, no, Bhante. Therefore, it is not fitting to maintain that myself is of a nature to feel. A little bit different, but the same. From the from the time Ananda, when a monk no longer regards sensations as the self or the self as being impercipient, or as being percipient and of a nature to feel, by not so regarding regarding, he clings to nothing in the world. Not clinging. He is not excited by anything, and not being excited, he gains personal liberation, and he knows, or she knows, birth is finished, the holy life has been led, done was what had to be done, there is nothing more here. This is when it gets a little tricky for those who don't know much about the Dhamma. This sounds terrible. <laughs> like, birth is finished. The holy life has been lived. And done is what had to be done. There is nothing more here. But that's actually really nice. <laughs> it's a very liberating feeling. It's just... And that's why I translate that usually as unwholesome states are finished. Because it's hard to grasp but I feel like this is understood or close too often these ideas these profound understandings of Buddhism are wrongly interpreted as kind of being pessimistic and things like that and like when it's translated as not being excited by anything, 
it's true, but we have to understand it comes from that equanimity we've developed through meditation, which has to come through joy and happiness. So, but if we don't know that, then it sounds a little terrible. So, and these translations there, they tend to be a little bit more on that side because they've been influenced by these, this wrong view that's crept in the teaching for so long. But there's, yes, maybe one day I'll get to translating it too, but uh, we'll see. Not today. This idea of not self is at the very, very core of liberation in the Buddhist teaching. So, and the way that it can be understood and the way that it's digestible here is that we stop taking things personal all the time because that is the major thing that we do is we take everything personal whether it's anything and that's really creating us a lot of problems suffering but it's just problems really that when you stop th taking things so personal you're just free it's so good they might say hurtful things to you but there's not even there's nothing to hook on it's just this this teflon oh okay <laughs> okay and usually actually it there's a lot of compassion because you can see these people are hurting and because they don't see how much they're hurting themselves through that and propagating what they've had from their youth or whatever. And they're just, they don't know the direction of the, the wheel and how it works and how it turns and therefore they don't know how to spin the wheel of Dharma. And if anyone were to say to a monk whose mind was thus freed that the Tathagata exists after death, <laughs> that would be seen by him as a wrong opinion and unfitting. Likewise exists, neither exists nor not exists after death, both exists nor does not exist after death. Why so? As far on and as designation and the range of designation reaches, as far as language and the range of language reaches, as far as concepts and the range of concepts reaches, as far as understanding and the range of understanding reaches, as far as the cycles reaches and revolves, that monk is liberated from all that by his direct experience. And to maintain that such a liberated monk does not know and see would be a wrong view and incorrect. See, that's why when people ask these crazy questions about the Buddha and if he's there still. And, but in his teaching is quite clear that when you're actually liberated these things, they're just like, what are you talking about? <laughs> it's... It doesn't even exist, it doesn't make any sense because it's just not understanding what liberation is. So, it's quite profound material that <laughs> you're, you're getting today, but it's quite nice. Go to the core. And now, this is a bit where he explains the wheel of the Dhamma, but he explains it in relation to the jhanas, but he doesn't call them the jhanas, he calls them something else. Ananda, there are seven stations of consciousness, oh, and two realms. 
Which are the seven? There are beings different in body and different in perception, such as human beings, some devas and some in the states of ho. That is the first station of consciousness. There are beings different in body and alike in perception, such as the devas of Brahma's retinue, born there on account of having attained the first jhana. That is the second station. There are beings alike in body and different in perceptions such as the Abhasara Devas of streaming radiance. That is the third station. There are beings alike in body and alike in perception, such as the Subhakinna Devas. That is the fourth station. There are beings who have completely transcended all perception of matter by the vanishing of perceptions of sense reactions and by the non-attention to the perception of variety. Thinking space is infinite. They have attained to the sphere of infinite space that is the fifth station. There are beings who, by transcending the sphere of infinite space, thinking consciousness is infinite, have attained the sphere of infinite consciousness, that is the sixth station. There are beings who, having transcended the sphere of infinite consciousness, thinking there is no thing, have attained to the sphere of nothingness. This is the seventh station of consciousness. The two realms are the realm of the unconscious beings and secondly, the realm of neither perception or non-perceptions. And these are two places you can, the highest, I guess the latest places you can be reborn as. This is only mental, no body. And sometimes people will see the beings in these realms when they're in meditation. And so that's why he explains it a little bit like that. Or maybe with some practice you will, some people can get to, to see that or to direct, incline their mind if they so desire it to or maybe some memory of that particular kind of existence with the, each factors of these jhanas like the abhasaras, the radiant joy. Now Ananda as regards the first station of consciousness with difference of body and difference of perception as in the case of human beings and so on. If anyone were to understand it, first noble truth, its origin, second noble truth, its cessation, third noble truth, its attraction and its peril and the deliverance from it, fourth noble truth. This is another way that he had of explaining things sometimes, uh, the rising, the passing away, impermanence, the attraction and the peril, or the indulgence and the danger. Sometimes it's translated like that. And it's escape. The deliverance from it, would it be fitting for that person to take pleasure in it? No, Lord. And has regards the other stations, and the two spheres likewise, no bante. And this means that uh, when we, and this is talking about discernment, obviously, every time the Buddha talks about the Four Noble Truths, the awakened understandings, he's talking about discernment. And 
like in the first jhana for example there's uh, joy arising from letting go from detachment relaxing and or perhaps the metta but there's still the thinking and we and with discernment we realize the ma the mind realizes that the thinking is gross even though we're not actually thinking about that it's like thinking is gross and then it just fades away and we let it go well this process of letting go is discernment in action this is applying the four noble truths and this is what it's talking about here and so when you see the when you understand that base and its origin its release if there is a release because usually the mind will tend towards the release as we practice this its attraction per peril and deliverance then there there will not be any clinging to it and what he's doing now he's he's explaining that there's even clinging in the jhanas so he's saying so <laughs> practice this but then don't be attached to it and that's where the the four foundations of mindfulness the resting places of awareness when it's mental states as mental states is that for example we just understand dhamma and sitting letting go of distractions smiling the mind will naturally be joyful but we don't necessarily take it as personal it's just nature and then however long that takes then there will be all the stations of consciousness arising each one after the other because we are understanding them we're not attached to them so they just come and then they pass whenever they need to pass because that is dhamma we can't force it and then in this way we are wise and we're not even clinging to the jhanas even though we're practicing them so <laughs> Ananda, insofar as a monk having known, or anybody having known, as they really are these seven stations of consciousness and these two spheres, their origin, cessation, attraction, peril, and freed without attachment, that monk Ananda is called one who is liberated by wisdom. Now, that I... I just explained that so uh, wisdom here is discernment obviously and so not being attached even to these jhanas Sariputta there's uh, some uh, a Samyutta a whole chapter that uh, Sariputta comes back and uh, his, his features are bright and Ananda says oh Bhante your features are bright what did you do all day <laughs> said oh I was just sitting in the first jhana all day he said but it didn't occur to me I'm entering the first jhana or I am in the first jhana or I'm coming out of the first jhana but it just was what it was and Ananda said oh it must be because Bhante has been spent a, a long time doing this and so he's not even attached to he doesn't even care or and he said that with each of the jhanas this is the chapter is like that sutta with each of the jhana so you can imagine the repetition but <laughs> so it's just happening yes there's joy but there's no uh, it's just completely open completely free and so uh, like this we we practice the wheel we turn the wheel of the Dhamma without even being attached to the wheel of the Dharma, which is interesting. And this grows, it grows stronger as we practice. There are, Ananda, these eight liberations. What are they? Possessing form, one sees forms. That is the first liberation. Not perceiving material forms in oneself, one sees them outside. That is the second liberation as not self thinking it is beautiful 
one becomes intent on it, this is the fourth jhana. This is one of the places where he calls it the beautiful. That is the third. By completely transcending all perception of matter, by the vanishing of the perception of sense reaction, and by the non-attention to the perception of variety, thinking, space is infinite, one enters and abides in the space of in the sphere of infinite space, that is the fourth. By transcending the sphere of infinite space, thinking consciousness is infinite, one enters and abides in the sphere of infinite consciousness. By transcending the sphere of infinite consciousness, thinking there is no thing, one enters and abides in the sphere of nothingness, that is the sixth. By transcending the sphere of nothingness, one reaches and abides in the sphere of neither perception or non-perception, the limit of awareness. That is the seventh. By transcending the sphere of the limit of awareness, one enters and abides in the cessation of perception and sensation or felt experience. That is the eighth liberation. See, there's the... And when he explains the liberations, not the stages of consciousness, then he includes Niroda. Because it is not... A st <laughs> obviously, it's not... It's beyond the stage of consciousness. And in one way, this can be seen as... The jhanas can be seen as still something that we can be attached to but he also explains it in the ways that it these are progressive liberations of the mind so it's quite wonderful and practicing in this way we and i think this is probably the most important part of dependent origination is understanding that Dependent origination is the wheel of samsara, but the jhanas, the meditation, and the practice of the Dhamma, because virtue is part of meditation, the Eightfold Path is the wheel of samma samadhi. It, this whole, each of the factors, and that's why I said that to you yesterday, is because there are suttas, which I read here, in fact, the Great Forty, where he says, each of these flow into one another and this is turning the wheel and that is the wheel of the Dhamma and these are the progressive liberations this is the way out of this dependent origination Ananda when once a monk attains these eight liberations in forward order, in reverse order, in forward and reverse order, entering them and emerging from them as and when and uh, for as long as one wishes and has gained by one's own direct knowledge here and now both the destruction of the mental movements the stilling of the mental movements and the uncorrupted liberation of heart and liberation by wisdom discernment that monk is called both ways liberated and Ananda, there is no other way of both ways liberation that is more excellent or perfect than this. Thus the Lord spoke and the venerable Ananda rejoiced and delighted in his words. And that touches also the two kinds of liberations that he mostly talked about. Liberation by wisdom is uh, whatever arising, even jhanas, is not being attached to it, not being, seeing this not self. But both ways is someone who actually can 
that has the jhana mastery and the naroda mastery so it can go all the way up to naroda enter naroda whenever that person likes uh, come out of it whenever feels like it um, and this is called the person both ways liberated who's unattached to all of this too so he's or her uh, just haven't met her yet <laughs> But it totally is possible. Uh, and that's the thing also that people don't understand often is that by practicing this practice of jhana to that depth, like seeing Niroda, entering Niroda, you have to understand dependent origination. There's no way. There's no way. And you don't only have to d understand dependent origination at its core but also know the wheel of dhamma and which direction that is and that is letting go relaxing smiling <laughs> cultivating love cultivating compassion forgiveness states that are not sticky they're just generous, open, and however we might talk, like it's so clearly explained here, uh, however we might explain dependent origination, paticca samuppada, if we practice the jhanas to, to the level of niroda, you are using dependent origination as you're working you're understanding it and so dependent origination is the wheel the blueprint of the wheel of samsara and the jhanas is the path of practice and the direction. <laughs> Good. I was, I'm reading the Mahavaga, the Vinaya, and um, I was reading about the Upasata and the monks and how we uh, have the Visuddhi, the ceremony that we, we can, we tell what we've uh, done wrong or like a dukkata uh, anything in the past two weeks every upasata and we have to okay it's you have to say what you and it doesn't it's it's called visuddhi because it's the purification it's like and it's not someone it's not like a cardinal who's like purifying you or something like that it's like anybody any of the monks there's no not supposed to be any hierarchy in the sangha it doesn't it's not the way it works except in some countries it's kind of happened but technically and um, except seniority of course of course there is seniority but like a we don't have a sangha pope <laughs> so um, there shouldn't be anyone anyways so but it was beautiful because the I it, it also explains why <laughs> and the Buddha the because the Buddha said is a stumbling block for you in your life not to keep these things inside and that's why forgiveness meditation meditation is important it's just practicing forgiveness with yourself with others uh, it says and it's like a, a stumbling block for what it's like the first John is the second John third John because the mind is cannot be uplifted so, so that was a beautiful reading <laughs>